Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brothers and sisters. Welcome to uh, another night of History Nights. And it's uh, the second series uh, in collaboration with Ilmfid and Islamic <laughs> Relief. For this series, we have a special guest, as you can see on the other side of the screen, our beautiful brother, Mustafa Briggs. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. How are you doing? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Your, your dress code just gets better and better, bro. <laughs> I try my try and make the effort for you guys. <laughs> I'm just doing a bit of branding, you see. That's all I can do. <laughs> it's, it's important, man. It's very important. <laughs> how how's things in your side of the world? Alhamdulillah, I'm all good. I just arrived in Senegal an hour ago. <laughs> so I rushed here from the airport, set up my laptop just in time to be able to give you guys this class, inshallah. Uh, mashallah. I think the last time I spoke to you, which was two weeks ago, um, mm. you were in Cairo, right? Yes, I was. Yes, and now you're p uh, partying in uh, Senegal. No, I'm not. My own <laughs> <laughs> no, good, good, good. You're on your break, right? Yeah, I'm on break from um, studies at the moment until the 1st of November. So I just came to Senegal to see some of my teachers. Um, and, you know, Rabi al Awal is here, so they'll be having a series nice. of conferences. We're going to be speaking in a conference here on the 26th, inshallah. And then the celebration um, in Medina Bay will be on the 29th. And then I'll head back to Egypt on the 31st, inshallah. Oh, mashallah, mashallah. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, brothers and sisters, those of you who are watching, tonight's uh, title is Nana Aspal and the Female Scholars of West Africa. Those of you watching for the first time, uh, there's a thing that we always ask you to do. Let us know in the comment section where you're watching from, which country or which city. Um, and it's really nice, actually. You find all sorts of places across the world, people saying salam. And it's that one ummah, that unity that we find within this. So share it with us, inshallah, where you're from. Also, please do like, share, and subscribe, both in Ilfried and Islam Relief pages. Um, if you're watching on YouTube... Uh, subscribe if you're watching twitter please be tweet and uh, inshallah that way whatever we push goes out to more people more people benefit and it's more subtle for everyone involved inshallah so without any further ado i'm going to pass it over to our brother mustafa briggs bismillah over to you assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala Allahumma ashrah li sadri wa salli amri wa halakum li sani yafqadu qawli insha'Allah bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim So assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah It's a pleasure to be with you again for the third week of Black History Month and this week I'll be talking about Nana Asma'u and the female scholars of West Africa So this is a very important topic and I feel it's a topic that doesn't get coverage from two angles We hardly ever speak about female scholarship within the deen and then we hardly ever speak about Islamic scholarship in West Africa in general so with the combination of the two in this subject inshallah and i've given a lecture on this previously called daughters of fatima which i will condense here for you guys inshallah um in the time frame so before we talk about female scholars in west africa and i explained last week how islam entered west africa and how islam spread in west africa we should look back at the history of female scholarship that we have in the deen in the first place, starting with, um, I would say, Sayyida Aisha, the wife of the Prophet So the Prophet was somebody that was very much devoted to teaching his female Sahaba just as much as he taught the male Sahaba. And the female Sahaba around the Prophet ﷺ played an important role in the establishment of Islam and in the spread of Islam, and particularly in the spread of and the preservation of knowledge. So if we look, for example, there was a Sahabia called Shira bint Abdullah, and the Prophet ﷺ invited her to come and teach his wife Hafsa how to read and write. As literacy wasn't very big in Arabian society at that time, uh, specifically with women. If people could read and write, usually they were men. But the Prophet ﷺ brought a teacher in to teach his own wives how to read and write, and that woman was called Shira bint Abdullah, and she taught his wife Sayyida Hafsa. And uh, Ibn Ab Abdul Bar said Shira was amongst the virtuous and intelligent women, and the Prophet ﷺ used to visit her himself. So the Prophet ﷺ would go and visit this 
woman, this female scholar we could call her. And similarly, if we look at Sayyidah Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu and Sayyidah Um Salama, another wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were known for their literary, literary skills. They were known for reading and writing. And there are many letters of Sayyidah Aisha and Um Salama recorded in the sources that we have in Islamic history. And if we think about the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he first heard the revelation, when the Quran was first revealed to him, it was his wife Sayyidatina Khadija that first believed in him. And the first collection of the Quran was collected and kept by his other wife Sayyidah Hafsa bint Umar. So we can see that the Quran itself, which is the mother of all knowledge in Islam, which is the center of all knowledge in Islam, the first person to believe in the Quran was a woman. And the first person to compile the Quran was a woman. And it was from Sayyidah Hafsa's um, Mus'haf <clears throat> that Sayyidina Omar and Sayyidina Uthman derived the Mus'haf that we have today. So we know in Sayyidina Uthman's time, he wrote four Mus'hafs and sent them to four different centers of the Islamic world. And it's from those four Mus'hafs that we have the Quran that we have today. So the deen itself and the knowledge of the deen was preserved through the effort, through the love, and through the dedication of these women, these mothers of the believers, and these wives of the Prophet ﷺ. And if we look at Sayyidah Aisha, she was said to be the most expert Sahaba in fiqh. Urwa, who was one of the other Sahaba, and Atta ibn Abi Rabba said, Aisha was the most expert in fiqh amongst all the people. And Urwa said, I have never seen anyone more knowledgeable of fiqh than Aisha. And amongst the companions, Um Salama was also a faqiha. So she was also somebody who was well aware of fiqh and used to give fiqh opinions. And what was interesting is that the Prophet Sallallahu as we know, fiqh is derived from the sunnah. And the sunnah is defined as what the Prophet Sallallahu said, what the Prophet Sallallahu did, and what was done in his presence that he did not object to. But there were things that the Prophet Sallallahu did, for example, in the comfort of his own home that nobody would have access to except his wives. So we have many different fiqh opinions coming from Sayyidah Aisha, coming from Sayyidah Um Salama, and coming from the different wives of the Prophet Sallallahu as they had an access to the Prophet Sallallahu that the general Sahaba did not have. And another female Sahaba that was known for her knowledge and expertise of the Sunnah was Ar-Rubay bint Ma'awid. So Ibn Abbas, despite his knowledge, and we all know Ibn Abbas is an amazing scholar, he used to consult her and study with her, as did Abdullah ibn Umar, especially on a particular judgment related to divorce law um, during the reign of Sayyidina Uthman. And we see Sayyidah Aisha's interpretation of many different verses of the Qur'an become very popular amongst the fuqaha, the people that deal with fiqh. And there are many compilations of hadith and books of tafsir that um, have so many quotations from Aisha that one of the early scholars even compiled um, her commentary on different Quranic verses and it became a 500 page book. And so Aisha was known عنها, for her expertise in the Quran, her expertise in inheritance laws, in halal and haram, in poetry, in Arabic literature, in Arab history, in genealogy, and even in medicine. And she has narrated over 2,210 hadith. So if we look at the deen and how the deen was preserved and passed down, we can see that women have played a major role in the deen from the earliest times, from the time of the Prophet ﷺ and the time of the Salaf up until now. And um, even afterwards, we look, for example, Sa'ad ibn Musayb. He taught all of the hadith that he had to his daughter, who was a tabi, she was from the following generation. And her husband said about her, she was the most beautiful of people and the most expert of people who knew the book of Allah by heart. And she was the most knowledgeable of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and the most aware of the rights of her husband. This was her husband talking about her. We also have another person from the Salah called Abu Nu'aym who narrated that one morning, the husband of uh, this lady that I mentioned earlier took his cloak to go out. And when she said, where, and she said, so he took his cloak, Abu Naim took his, took his cloak on and he was going out somewhere. And then his wife asked, where are you going? And she said, and he said, I'm going to the majlis of, Sa of Saeed to get knowledge. And she said, sit here, I'll teach you all of the knowledge of Saeed. So this was um, the daughter of Saeed bin Musayib. Uh, talking her husband was narrating that he went to go he wanted to go and study with her father but she said sit down I'll teach you all the knowledge that you could learn from my father because she had learned the knowledge as well and if we look at 
Imam Malik, who was one of the Imams, one of the four Imams of Fiqh that we have in uh, in Islam. Imam Malik's daughter learned all of his hadith and memorized the whole of his book, al muwatta which was the first book compiling hadith in the history of Islam um, and one of the most authentic books. They used to say al muwatta is the most authentic book after the book of Allah. And this was before Sahih Bukhari, before Sahih Muslim, before the other six compilations of hadith that we have. But Muwatta was interesting because it was a compilation of not just uh, hadith, but it was hadith and fiqh, and it formed the basis of the Maliki school, which is popular across northern Africa and western Africa. And so Imam Malik's son had not studied as much as his daughter. As Zubair narrated that Malik had a daughter who knew all his knowledge by heart. And whenever a reader made a mistake, she would correct him. However, Muhammad, his son, was not drawn to study and scholarship. And sometimes he would pass by with his clothes in disarray. And Malik would say to his students, good manners are in the hands of God. Look at the difference between my son and my daughter. So his daughter was the one that inherited his intellectual legacy and inherited his his knowledge. And we have to remember as well, in the early generations of Islam, women attended the masjid as men attended. And the women learned from going to the masjid and spending time with the Prophet Sallallahu and spending time with the scholars of that generation. Obviously, they would conform to the Sharia and they would wear their proper hijab and they would, you know, com comport themselves in the best of ways. But we have to remember that they were present. So if we look, for example, Hind bint Usaid al-Ansariya learned Surah Qaf from hearing the Prophet sallallahu recite it in Salah. So she was a woman that used to come and pray in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu behind the Prophet sallallahu And she memorized Surah Qaf just from listening to the Prophet sallallahu recite it. And Umm Darda, who was an orphan under the companionship of Abu Darda, another female sahaba, used to come to the masjid with Abu Darda in two garments and she would pray in the men's section. This was before she reached um, the age of maturity. And she used to teach and she used to sit in the circles of the teachers and learn the Quran. And then when she reached the age of maturity, Abu Darda asked her to return to the rows of the women or to join the rows of the women behind the men. But we can see that women and female Sahaba played an active and present role in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and they were essential in learning knowledge and preserving knowledge which leads me to where i'm going you just have to bear with me inshallah and i'll get there <clears throat> so um um darda after the time of the prophet sallallahu passed and they moved to damascus she used to hold classes herself in the masajid in damascus and in jerusalem and she even used to teach in her house and sometimes she would enter the men's section of the mosque to teach male and female students. And during the time of the Khalif Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he even came and studied with her in, 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 in some of her classes. So this is a female Sahaba that we know that preserved knowledge from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and then went on to teach knowledge in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then if we continue now and look into female scholarship in Africa. We'll begin in North Africa and then we'll come down to West Africa where we will reach and arrive to the stories of Nana Asma and the female West African scholars who followed in her path. But knowledge in Africa and women of knowledge in Africa, Muslim women of knowledge in Africa begins much earlier than that with the family of the Prophet Sallallahu that migrated into Africa. So if we look, there is a great, great granddaughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was called Sayyida Nafisa. <coughs> and Sayyida Nafisa was the daughter of a man called Hassan Al-Anwar. And Hassan Al-Anwar was the son of Zayd Al-Ablaj. Zayd Al-Ablaj was the son of Imam Al-Hassan, who was the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she was a descendant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi family. And she moved from Medina Munawwara, where her father Al-Hassan served as the governor of Medina, to Cairo as she was married to one of her cousins who was descended from Imam al Hussein, and they decided to migrate to Cairo where I live currently <laughs> and her masjid is still there. And so when she moved there, she used to teach and she had a large congregation of male and female students. And one of her most famous students is Imam al-Shafi'i. So Imam al-Shafi'i in his time in Cairo, he used to study with Sayyida Nafisa and she financially sponsored Imam Shafi's education for him. So Ibn Kathir narrates in the Bidaya wa Nihaya 
that she was a wealthy lady and she did a lot of favors for the people, especially the paralyzed people and people with severe illnesses and all ill people. And she was devout, she was ascetic and she was of abundant virtue. And when Imam Shafi arrived in Egypt, she did good to him and he would lead prayers in her house in Ramadan and was a frequent guest to her house and used to listen to her lectures in the mosque as well as asking for her dua and seeking barakah from her. And when Imam Shafi felt sick and thought that he was about to pass away, he felt that he was about to pass away, he wrote in his wasiya, in his will, that Sayyidina Nafisa should read dua over him before he is buried. And so when Imam Shafi passed away, his body was taken to the house of his sheikha, his female teacher, Sayyidina Nafisa, and she made dua for him. And then he was taken and they performed his janazah and he was buried. Another descendant of the Prophet Sallallahu is Sayyida Aisha bin Jafar al-Sadiq. And as we know, Jafar al-Sadiq was one of the major ulama of this ummah. He was a teacher of many of the religious scholars as well as many of the scientific scholars. And he was the son of Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, who was the son of Imam Zayn al-Abidin, who was the son of Imam al Hussein, who was the son of Sayyida Fatima al Zahra, the daughter of the Prophet, وسلم, and Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so she had studied with her father and with her mother. And Imam Malik said about her father, No eye has seen, or no ear has ever heard, or no mind has ever conceived of a man who is better than Jafar in knowledge, in, pi- in ilm, knowledge, in taqwa, and in piety, and in God consciousness, or fear of Allah. And Sayyida Aisha, his daughter, studied with him and she also moved to Cairo and she has a mosque there and she's buried in her mosque as her sister-in-law Sayyida Nafisa was. Sayyida Nafisa was married to the brother of Aisha bint Jafar al-Sadiq. So these are all female scholars that we see in the early days of Islam in Africa as Egypt (laughs) is in Africa and not in the Middle East. And then if we continue further west, we look at the earliest university in the world. So the first university in the world, which was founded in 859, and is the oldest university in the world that is still giving out degrees, which was the Qarawin University in Morocco. It was founded by a Muslim female scholar, and her name was Fatima al-Fihriya. So Fatima al-Fihriya was born in the town of Karawan in present-day Tunisia. And her family migrated to Fez, the capital of Morocco, from Karawan. And her father, Muhammad al-Fihri, was a successful and wealthy merchant. And when he passed away, he left a lot of money behind to his two daughters, uh, Fatima and Maryam. So Fatima went on to build a masjid called the Karawin Masjid, which then became a university and is the oldest university in the world and is still running today in Morocco. And her sister, Maryam, founded Al-Andalus Masjid. And both of of these masjids can be found in Fez in modern day Morocco. So if we look at these amazing women, mashallah, we see Sayyida Nafisa with her own masjid teaching classes. We see Sayyida Aisha also with her own masjid. And then we see Fatima, Sayyida Fatima Al-Fihriya and Maryam Al-Fihriya building masajid and establishing the earliest university in the world in Morocco. And this is all in North Africa. So as we know, as I mentioned in the last video, we know the spread of Islam was through the connection between North Africa and West Africa. And West Africans started to adopt Islam and also started to study the religious sciences. And as the men studied the religious sciences, they did not leave the women behind. And so if we go to West Africa, and we look at the empire, the Khilafa of Sayyidi Uthman Danfodio, we see that in his Khilafa, one of the things that he was fighting for the most were the rights of women to education, as society in that time had denied women their rights. They, the women weren't encouraged to memorize Quran, women weren't encouraged to study fiqh, to study lugha. They were merely kept in their houses and forced to do a lot of housework. But Sayyidi Osman Danfodio wanted to change this. And so when he took over northern Nigeria and established his Islamic empire called the Sokoto Khilafah, his daughters were scholars 
to the same level as his sons, and he set them up as an example. And one of them was Nana Asma of Danfodio. She is the most famous one. But her sister, Mariam Danfodio, was also a scholar, but I'll talk a bit about her later. We'll focus on Nana Asma for now. So Nana Asma had memorized the Quran and studied all of the religious sciences with her father. And she was fluent in four languages, and she wrote books and poems in all of those four languages. So the four languages she was fluent in was Arabic, um, which is the Berber language, uh, Hausa, which is the native language of the northern Nigerian tribes, um, the Hausa people, and Fulani, which was the language of her own ethnic group. And she would use the Arabic script in a way called Ajami to write poems and to write books and preach to people in these four languages. And she was a very famous scholar, and she used to give her father advice, as well as her brother, Sultan Muhammad Bello, when he took over the Sokoto Khilafa after the passing of their father. So while she was revolutionary in her time, was not only was she an author, not only was she a teacher, um, but she established an organization, well, people say she established it, but it had already existed before her, but she merely consolidated it and expanded it using her father's political influence, and it was called Antaru, um, spelled Y-A-N-T-A-R-U. And what this was, was, this was a coalition of female scholars, and women would study under a female teacher called uh, Jaji. And this woman would teach them everything they needed to know in terms of knowledge of the Quran, Arabic language, fiqh, and not just religious sciences, but also practical skills, also business skills, also entrepreneurship, and all of these things in order for the women to become not only intellectually and educationally independent, but financially stable as well. And so when women would join the network, they would study under the female scholar until they would be given uh, what we could say a degree or a certificate, certification that they could now be jajis themselves, they could now be female scholars, and each one of them would then go back to their own communities or go off into a new community and gather women and teach them and continue to spread knowledge. And this is a system that is still in place today. There are female scholars in northern Nigeria that have silsilas, meaning they have lineages of knowledge, as in she studied from a teacher who studied from a teacher who studied from a teacher that go back all the way to Nana Asma Udanfodio herself. And so this was revolutionary in the fact that it encouraged and supported female education and female empowerment as it was the women studying and teaching for themselves without the influence of the men or without the support of the men. <clears throat> And Sayyidi Usman Danfodio was very interesting in that he was one of the earliest Islamic scholars and one of the first Islamic scholars to release a fatwa, uh, a religious edict, banning female genital mutilation, which was a practice that is was ongoing at that time and is still happening now. And there are many debates within the Muslim world about FGM, about female genital mutilation. Many um, non-governmental organizations are becoming activists talking about this. But Usman Danfodio already spoke out about it in his time. Not only that, but he issued fatawa, allowing women to go out and seek knowledge if their fathers or their husbands did not have the knowledge that they required um, to allow them to be taught in their houses. So he said, a woman, it's obligatory on a woman to go out and study. And so if her father and or her husband cannot teach her at home, or bring somebody to teach her at home, she has the full right to leave the house and go and look for an education for herself. This is how dedicated Usman Danfodio was to female scholarship and to female education. And not only did he teach his daughter Nana Mariam, okay, Nana Asma'u, but also Nana Mariam. And she was one of the first ones, she wrote a biography or a risala that spoke about the, the history of her father's jihads and her father's migrations. So a lot of what we know about Sayyidi Usman Danfodio was actually passed down to us through the documents that we have that were written by his daughter, Sayyida Mariam Danfodio as well. And if we travel further west into Senegal, where I am now, one of the most famous scholars that we have here in Senegal is called Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. His family recently just finished the completion of a masjid called Masalikul Jinan, which is the largest masjid in West Africa. 
And here in Senegal, they have, mashallah, a lot of influence on authority. And so Sheikh Ahmed Bamba was an amazing scholar. He mastered all of the religious sciences. He was a visionary, he was a revolutionary. And he was so popular that the French felt very threatened by his presence in the country. And so they sent him out on exile to Gabon for seven years. And then when he returned, he was sent out on another exile to Mauritania for four years. And then when he returned, he was placed under house arrest for 15 years until he passed away. But in that time, throughout his life, he wrote many poems and many books, not only poems gathering the traditional religious knowledge and versifying them to allow easy access and easy memorization, but thousands and thousands of books and poems in praise of the Prophet Sallallahu and talking about the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the characteristics of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's said that he's written over seven tons of books and poems. Um, and they can all be found today in his city, Tuba. So why Sheikh Ahmed Bamba is interesting and we're mentioning him here in a lecture about female scholarship is that he was the product of female scholarship as his maternal grandmother, Sahna Astawalo, was his first teacher. When he was around seven years old, his father, Mamur Antasali, sent him to his grandmother's house for him to begin his Quranic education. And so she was the one that first started teaching him the Quran before passing him to his maternal uncles, who then uh, he, who he completed his Quranic memorization with. And not only that, but his mother, Mam Jara Buso, whose real name was Mariama Buso, was known as a faqiha. She was known as a scholar of fiqh that had mastered the Maliki fiqh text Muhtasar Khalil. And it was said that in her time in Senegal, nobody could understand Muhtasar Khalil and teach it as well as Mam Jara Buso. She used to read the Quran and read other books of Salawat on the Prophet Khairat every day. And before she got married to Sheikh Ahmed Bamba's father, when she was young, she was around 18 when she got married. 50 people had already memorized the Quran from her as she had memorized the Quran in her mother's house. And her mother, Sahna Astawalo, had a masjid, she had a farm, and she had a madrasa which had thousands of students. And so the students would work on the farm for her in order to sustain themselves and they would study with her. So she was a woman that would teach men and women. And her daughter, the mother of Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, was also a teacher. And this was a tradition that Sheikh Ahmed Bamba continued within his own family and with his own daughters. So if we look at some of his daughters, um, I don't have enough time to talk about all of them, but we have, for example, Sheikh Maimuna Al-Kabir. And I've written an article about this. If you Google Mustafa Briggs, um, female scholars of Senegal, you'll be able to see all of this information in more detail. But he had, for example, one of his eldest daughters was called Sheikha Maimuna, and she memorized the Quran. She started memorizing the Quran at the age of seven. And when she finished memorizing the Quran, she came and she had to prove that she had memorized it by writing the Quran out by hand and giving it as a gift to her father, as was the practice in Senegal and still is the practice in Senegal today. And so she wrote the Quran from Alif Lam Mim Dalik Al Kitabu all the way to Min Al Jinnati Wan Nas with all of the Tashkil, all of the Fathas, the Dhammas and the Kasras without making any mistakes from memory and without referencing any other copies of the Quran. And she gave it as a gift to her father. And he was so pleased with this gift. She continued to do this throughout her life. And she wrote over the time of her father, 20 Qur'ans and gave them as gifts to her father. And there was an interesting story <laughs> between uh, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba and the uh, his, one of his teachers who was called Sheikh Sidiya from Mauritania. So the women in Mauritania were also known for their scholarship, but they weren't um, encouraged to do housework as they had domestic servants to help them with the housework. So Sheikh Sidiya came to visit Sheikh Ahmed Bamba in Senegal with his daughters, who when Sheikh Ahmed Bamba was studying in Mauritania saw were scholars and he wanted his daughters to be the same as them, if not better. And so when Sheikh Sidiya came to visit him with his daughters, he also he gave money to his daughter, Sheikh Maimuna, and said, I want you to cook an amazing meal for the guests that we are about to have so we can receive these guests. And then I want you to come and bring your Quran and show them. And so that's what happened. They came, she cooked a meal. They were amazed with the meal. And then she came and brought her Quran and displayed it to them and was displaying to them some of her poetry and different things that she had written. And so 
Sheikh Ahmed Bamba said, would you believe me if I told you that the same daughter who cooked this amazing meal is also the same daughter who wrote this Quran? And so they were amazed with the effort that he put in raising and training his daughters. He had another daughter, Sheikh Muslim back in, was commonly known as Sahih Muslim. And she was a, not only a scholar, but she was a poet and a businesswoman. And she specialized in the seerah of the Prophet and she used to teach the seerah to both men and women. And she was the first one to write a poem detailing the biography of her father, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. And Sheikh Maimuna, one of the stories around her and the Quran is that one day when she was presenting a copy of the Quran to her father that she had written, the father received news that one of his wives had given birth to a daughter who would be his last daughter. And in Senegalese culture and society, one of the greatest things you can do to honor a person is to name a child after them. And so he named his last daughter after one of his older daughters. So there was Maimuna Al-Kabir and Maimuna Sagir. And Sheikh Maimuna Sagir grew up to love the Quran and follow in the footsteps of her namesake. And she founded her own masjid and Quranic school in a small village called Darul Wahab near her father's city of Tuba. And she was known for sponsoring thousands and thousands of meals to be handed out on the 27th night of Ramadan, which was a celebration in Tuba called Laylatul Qadr, to the point that in Senegal, anytime you talk about Laylatul Qadr, everybody talks about Sheikha Maimuna and the effort she used to make in the celebration of Laylatul Qadr. And she would sponsor Quranic recitation ceremonies and recitation ceremonies of her father's poetry. And she would feed all the guests that came to celebrate on this night. And Sheikh Ibrahim Nyas, another famous West African scholar, was also very similar in his education of his female children, many of whom still live today and are examples today, and I'll end with his example. So he said in a public address in his native language of Wolof, women are something great and magnificent in the sight of God. So we should not neglect our female children, but we should respect them because these girls will grow up to become the women who raise and train mankind tomorrow. And so he had many daughters, and he made sure that all of his daughters memorized the Quran and studied Islamic sciences alongside um, his, uh, alongside his sons. So his eldest daughter, for example, Fatima Zahranias, memorized the Quran and she remembers, I remember she said she remembers studying and memorizing the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi with her brother, Sheikh Abdullah Nias, who was the successor of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. And her scholarship and her dedication to education can be seen in her children, who today are famous scholars across the world, Sheikh Hassan Sise, Sheikh Mahi Sise, and Sheikh Tijani Aliou Sise, who was voted uh, one of the top 20 most influential Muslims in the world by the Muslim 500. Sheikh Rukhaya Nias is also a daughter of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, and she worked with the Jimmy Carter Foundation on projects regarding female empowerment in Africa. And she was an author as well. She is an author, she is still alive. And her books, Primary Education for Muslim Children, Motherly Advice for Muslim Girls, and Rights of Women in Islam, which she wrote in Arabic in the 50s and 60s and 70s, have spread across Africa and have been and translated into English and French and are used as textbooks and curriculums at traditional Islamic schools across West Africa. And she was sent by her father, Sheikh Ibrahim Yas, to teach men and women across West Africa in Ghana, in Sierra Leone, and even in Nigeria. And he wrote in one letter to her, I forbid ignorant and greedy people to travel. But as for you, you have full authorization and wherever you step foot, I pray, will be a blessed place. And he also made dua and said, may Allah bless anybody who takes knowledge from her even if it's a single letter. And then another sister, Sheikh Maryam Nias, who I would say is the most famous daughter of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias and one of the most famous uh, Muslim, female Muslim scholars in the world at this time, was known for her famous Quran school, which she opened in the 50s in Dakar, which has seen tens and thousands of students from across West Africa and the Arab world studying and memorizing the Quran and other sciences. So she was so famous that Al Jazeera even came to Senegal and recorded a documentary about her. If you look on YouTube, you should, inshallah, be able to find it. And she used to travel with her father, Sheikh Ibrahim Yes, who served as vice president of the Muslim world 
Tariq and the vice president of the Muslim World Congress in the 60s and in the 70s. And so through that, she had relationships with uh, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, who used to invite her every year on Hajj, King Hassan II of Morocco, who used to invite her every year in Ramadan to Morocco to take part in the Durus al Hassaniya, which are, you know, Islamic lessons hosted by the King of Morocco in his palace. And in her Al Jazeera interview, she talks about all of this and more. And she's uh, well known for her education of children and we see the depth of her education in the fact that her son, Professor Usman Khan, is now the head of Islamic science, Islamic studies and African and African American studies departments at Harvard University in America. So she taught her son and her son studied with her as well as going to French school and he managed to be able to graduate, get a doctorate get a PhD, travel to America, and the most prestigious university in America, Harvard University, he is a tenured professor there. And um, mashallah, somebody that's working very, very hard to preserve and spread knowledge um, in the modern education system. And another sister that they have, Sheikha Umul Khairinyas, lived in Niger. She still lives in Niger. And she has an organization there called Jamia to Nasarat Deen which has 200,000 members who are all women and nearly 100 chapters in Niger and eight other West African countries. And they build schools, they build free clinics, and they build education centers to teach women how to read and write and entrepreneurship skills. As she wanted to fight the infant mortality rate that she saw in Niger and the poverty and the illiteracy that she saw in Niger. So this is an example of how these female scholars were not just scholars in their Islamic studies, but they transferred their religious scholarship into practical efforts to help educate and renovate and change their societies. And she was actually awarded the Global Humanitarian Citizen Award from Tufts University for outstanding leadership and service to the global community in pursuit of a more just, equitable and peaceful society. And Tufts University is based in Massachusetts in the United States. So this is just a small example of the long history that we have of female Islamic scholarship within the deen and its specific manifestation in West Africa. And I'm going to, inshallah, end the lecture here, but there's much more information available, inshallah, that we will be releasing over time. And I want to <clears throat> thank you all for taking the time out to enjoy this lecture with us today. Um, so the Daughters of Fatima lecture is available and I'll be making it available in book form and in video form inshallah which has this information and more and thank you for joining us today on the Ilm Beat show. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. MashaAllah, Jazakallah khair for this wonderful uh, insight into uh, female scholars of West Africa. I mean, the list was just going on, right? It's one after another. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone should just take notes and write the names down. <laughs> the funny thing is, like, you can still carry on. It I can, can still, still, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can keep going, man. But <laughs> and, and, I, and I think, inshallah, look, um, it's so sad that we have to even have these sort of discussions and to talk about, oh, there were female scholars who contributed to, contributed to modern-day Islam. Um, or how we find Islam a lot of the time are through female scholars. Um, and like it's 21st century, never says that you, you have to have the discussion. But um, we need to be able to support that kind of revival of institutions and female scholarship and engagement. Um, uh, and be nice. I, I think uh, Ilfid, I mean, as an outsider, I can say Ilfid's an organization that gives that space, that platform to female scholars. Um, and activists to get engaged and share their knowledge and, and you know, inspire people. Uh, so alhamdulillah, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's an amazing topic. And I'm sure, you know what, like you could have taken any one of those names. And I know you covered Nana Asmao, but you could have taken any one of those names and it could have been an hour segment on each one of those names. Um, yeah. So that's that. But the other thing I'll say, you see in Senegal, and, and the more you mention, uh, you know, Senegal and, 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 and some of the, Countries that might not norm or may not normally come on to your you know discussions or your platform, you wouldn't hear about Islamic heritage from uh, those sort of places in the world uh, because it's not highlighted enough, unfortunately. But mm. you, you might start wondering, and I was just thinking, imagine like what kind of food, what's the culture like? <laughs> 
And I'm not giving you any ideas. I've got, I've got trips where I take people to Senegal to explore all of that and more. So inshallah, you can sign up for that. I'll bring you along and you can experience it for yourself, inshallah. Yes, yes, yes. I want front row seats for everything, bro. <laughs> welcome, 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 it, maybe this is a, a hint for Ilfid. We can do some cultural exploration of uh, some mm-hmm. parts of Africa, inshallah. And I think it's important to highlight as well, as we said, these are countries whose scholarship and Islamic heritage are not usually highlighted. But now, alhamdulillah, Ilfid has taken the initiative along with yourselves at Islamic Relief to make this happen and to spread this knowledge. So I wanted to thank you both, um, both organizations, alhamdulillah, for allowing us to, yeah. uh, giving us the platform to, al- to allow us to share this with the world. So alhamdulillah. You know, you know, um, Christian nights can evolve into travel and tourism nights. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, 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 you, if you check out www.spiritofsenegal.com, Inshallah, everything's there. You can sign up for one of my trips. I've got one trip coming up in April 2021 and another one in uh, July where I'll be taking people to West Africa to be able to experience all of this. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And as, as, before we end, uh, you mentioned you're, you're in Senegal for next week. So next week is the final show of this series. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's uh, about uh, Ella Collins & Co., the women behind Islam in America. Yes. Um, I had no clue about it whatsoever until I saw your suggestions in the WhatsApp group saying this is, <laughs> um, this is going to be interesting for me. I'll be, unfortunately, I won't be here. I'll be back to Atik again. Um, okay. we to go. I mean, it takes two of us to do one of your jobs. So, um, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Atik will be back. Alhamdulillah. Atik will be back. Um, and again, sorry, today, today we had to have a bit of a delay. As you guys probably heard, uh, Brother Mustafa flew in go into his hotel and open up his laptop so we had to give him an hour to do so so um inshallah next week we'll be hopefully we'll be back at 7 p.m 7 p.m uk time uh, yeah. but do follow the facebook page or uh, for ill feed uh, and it's that relief we will post on there uh, the poster for next week and the timing etc uh, other than that any last words brother mustafa just wanted to say thank you for having me once again Looking forward to being with you next week, inshallah. And uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone.